Good morning, uh, students and my colleagues. On behalf of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, I have great pleasure in welcoming uh, Ambassador Amit Das Gupta for delivering a special lecture. So as you know, this very important uh, theme which we are going to discuss uh, both during the forenoon and the afternoon. And uh, this is something which we have to learn because uh, it's a huge subject which uh, Ambassador Das Gupta has chosen, new challenges for old diplomacy, and we need to really understand that complexity because something which is very, very important from geopolitics point of view. And uh, I'm very grateful to him that he has been able to spare time out of his schedule and agree to deliver two lectures. That is very important for us. And both the themes which he has chosen are very important ones for us. The second lecture which he's going to deliver at uh, 3 o'clock is on nuclear dimension in India-Australia relations because as you know that that, that factor uh, still remains an irritant between India and Australia. So I think it will be nice to hear from uh, Ambassador Das Gupta on these uh, very complex subjects. And I'm sure all of us in turn will learn from this experience. Feel free to ask questions, make it more interactive. This is what I have to say to you. Before I request my colleague, Dr. Monish Thongmaam, to introduce uh, our uh, guest speaker today for this special lecture, uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Das Gupta. <laughs> and I request you to, sir, uh, please come and take the seat here. Or Now I request Dr. Monish Thongmaam to introduce uh, the speaker. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning to one and all. Good morning, sir, for gracing this occasion and taking our time to come to our department and uh, for delivering such relevant lectures. Um, it will be uh, hard to encapsulate uh, the expertise and experience and the kind of accolades that Ambassador Amit Das Gupta has had over the years, but I'll try my best. Uh, Ambassador Amit Das Gupta is currently um, the India Country Director at the University of New South Wales, Australia. And he was also the first head of the Mumbai campus of the SPGN School of Global Management, where, where he was not only a part of the administrative division, but was also a part of the faculty. Ambassador Amit Das Gupta has been an alumni of various uh, preeminent and eminent institutions, including St. Xavier's College, uh, under Calcutta University, including Jawaharlal Nehru University, and also was a Commonwealth Fellow at McGill University in Canada, and was also an al alumnus of the Indian School of Business, Hyderabad. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Das Gupta um, joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1979 and served in various capacities in India and abroad, such as Cairo, Brussels, Kathmandu, Berlin, Sydney, and Manila. He was ambassador to the Philippines with concurrent accreditation to the Republic of Palau, the Marshall Islands, and Micronesia. But what, am I, what I'm going to say now uh, really reflects uh, which uh, is the most important part of Ambassador Das Gupta, and I would really say that he is what you call as a Renaissance man. Uh, he, uh, as anyone or every, all the students who have been a part of the public diplomacy course uh, should know this, that Ambassador Amit Das Gupta was instrumental in starting the public diplomacy division of India's Ministry of External Affairs way back in two, 2006. And why did I call him a Renaissance man? He, uh, and I called that because of his work in fiction. And he is the author of two books, The House and Other Stories, which uh, encapsulates Calcutta as a central character and really brings out experiences which can be in any city of the world through, through the stories of Mahua, The Little Red Book, and The House. He's also the uh, writer of Lessons from Ruslana in Search of Transformative Thinking. Uh, it's a fascinating book based on Ruslana Korsunova, who was a model who had uh, to meet a very untimely death. But, it, but the way Ambassador Das Gupta really brings out uh, lessons of life uh, from experiences like this is really central of, to the book. And he has also published in academic journals, civil society magazines, and newspapers on matters related to foreign security policy, management, and leadership issues on education and government policy. In 2013, the Multicultural Commission of the New South Wales Government in Australia awarded him the gold medal in recognition for his contribution during his tenure as the Indian Consul General in promoting multiculturalism and harmony. 
He is a distinguished fellow of the Australia India Institute and a senior fellow at the Society for Policy Studies. So without further ado, I will not stand in between you and Ambassador Dashgupta. Sir, please, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, really, thank you for this um, very warm welcome. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I find the frequency of my visits to Mahe have become pretty intense. I was here in December uh, when uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor uh, delivered a talk um, on China. And uh, so you have to suffer me today because um, um, I'm not as erudite a speaker as he is. And I want to make an apology right at the very outset is that uh, because I'm currently going through a bit of an eye problem, um, I'm not going to do a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, it's not just um, a death by PowerPoint, but um, sometimes um, visuals are very important. And I hope um, that uh, by the time I, I speak to you again in the near future, um, I will be able to demonstrate how, how often a visual captures to a significant degree what you're trying to say. So I will, I will, I, I know I'm speaking to a very distinguished and learned audience, so you will have to evoke the, the visuals in your mind from all the books and uh, pictures that you've seen and all the work that you do. So having said that, uh, today's talk, I really wanted to, uh, it sounds a bit sexy to say new challenges for old diplomacy. But um, really what I'm trying to say is that uh, diplomacy has evolved. And uh, there's nothing new about it. Diplomacy does evolve. Uh, but what is the dramatic transformation this has taken place? Um, I'd like to to submit to you in the short period that we have um, that there are five, essentially five critical challenges uh, that old diplomacy faces and old diplomats like me um, did not encounter. In fact, generations, a generation or so before me never accounted it and we at least got a glimpse of a part of it. Right. So let me basically assume that foreign policy is the pursuance of national strategic interests. That is, that is my definition of foreign policy. Diplomacy is a methodology or a strategy or a tool that is used. And what it does is through negotiation, through outreach activities, it tries to achieve foreign policy objectives by trying as far as possible to avoid armed confrontation or war. So that's the distinction I make between foreign policy and diplomacy. And diplomats do what diplomacy requires. When I said as far as possible, it also means that on certain occasions, armed confrontation or war, or war-like situations without a formal declaration of war might occur. And in that case, the role of the diplomat is to justify that their hand was forced and that they were, if you like, coerced into doing it because there was no alternative. An example, I think a very clear example of this, would be the bombing of, of Iraq and the removal of Saddam Hussein on the grounds that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Now, whether it is proved subsequently that there were no WMDs 
or not is not important. What is important is that the build-up to the bombing and the build-up to the US and allies intervention in Iraq was pushed by diplomats to be able to say that our hand has been forced. There are weapons of mass destruction. These weapons of mass destruction are A, not being declared, they are not available for inspection, and there is a strong likelihood that they would be used in areas and for reasons that are prejudicial to global interest. And consequently, their destruction is critical. It may also be argued that that was a red herring. That that was really not the objective of Washington. And we can discuss this. That the real objective of Washington was regime change. And this was nothing but a peg in order to remove Saddam Hussein. Whether to stretch, if you like, the argument, the idea really was not just the removal of Saddam Hussein, but through the removal of Saddam Hussein, to actually maintain an unstable situation in that part of the world, because God knows, I think all of us would agree, instability is good foreign policy. Many countries actually thrive when there, are, there is uncertainty. There is complete calm, there is no issues involved, everyone is everyone's pal, then neither researchers like yourself nor diplomats have anything to do. And so this is a perverse way of looking at it. So what was the purpose behind it? In any case, we can speculate on the purpose. I think what is clear is to be able to recognize that there is a national strategic interest that is out there. Diplomats are tasked with ensuring that that is protected, that is ensured, and that is multiplied. That is the job of diplomacy. Diplomacy is how do you amplify what ensures strategic interest, right? And strategic interest can be in multiple areas. It can be from energy security to defense to counterterrorism. There, there are multiple areas in which you water. You can identify and say, these are my core interests, and on these interests, it is non-negotiable. So we grew up in that tradition, and, and, and senior fantastic colleagues that I worked with grew up in, in the same tradition. Many of my colleagues, uh, senior colleagues, when I joined in 1979, never saw many of the new challenges that took place. And um, I still remember that um, when, when we were growing up as diplomats, the training that we received, how we were told that you, know, you need to be able to ferret out information. And you ferret out information through multiple ways. You, know, you meet other diplomats, you meet with government, you meet with all levels of diplomacy. You try and find out who is doing what and why are they doing it. Will it harm India's strategic interests? And therefore, what we should do about it? I think this, this really was the game plan. There are, there, are, there are fantastic ambassadors that I know who were posted in East Berlin at that time before the wall fell. And these were diplomats who were looking at the implications of what the relationship would be how would the Soviet Union deal with matters? How would we continue to maintain our core interests? What would happen if the Cold War ended? And all of this was a matter of extraordinary, almost better than a John Le Carre spy thriller, being able to craft and work through how we understood what was happening behind curtains. What actually was the shadow? And you pursued these shadows without telling yourself they were just shadows. 
In the process, you also looked at various other aspects. You looked at whether there was deception, whether there was a piece of information that you found which didn't work. You know, one of the talks I'm going to give today, immediately after this talk, is at the business school. And I was telling Arvind and, and faculty members of, of this fantastic center that the subject I'm going to speak about over there is on perceptions, misperceptions, and the way we see things. And one of the things I, I love doing, and I don't know all of you play and do jigsaw puzzles, but it's, it's a big passion with me and my wife hates it. And uh, the reason she hates it is because I normally do it on the dining table. And till I finish the puzzle, you can't use the dining table. And sometimes it takes six months to finish a puzzle. Now, the puzzle has two levels by which you increase difficulty. You can either increase difficulty with the complexity of the design. So, you know, you buy a box, the image is, is there, and you say, all right, so this is the puzzle I'm going to work on. So the complexity of the design, and I can tell you one of the most difficult puzzles I ever dealt with was the face of a black cat. So it's just the photograph of a black cat. And uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy puzzle, take it from me. The other, other puzzles that are very difficult are if you took a Mario Miranda drawing, I don't know if you've seen Mario Miranda's drawings, but if you took one of those, which is called, one is called the marketplace. If you took that drawing, the too many images and, you know, and trying to put those together is not easy. So it's the complexity of the design. The second way in which you increase the bar of difficulty is the number of pieces. So when we have children, we want to teach them how to put things together. We see their brain working. It's normally a three-piece, five-piece, seven-piece, eight-piece, nine-piece puzzle. And they put it together and we clap our hands. But nowadays the puzzles are 1,500, 2,000 pieces. They've also become three-dimensional puzzles. So this example is something I give to a lot of people when I speak about foreign policy and I speak about difficulty. I speak about how do you ferret out information. So I'll share it with you. It's, it's a tool which uh, I normally do when I speak to business uh, students. But I think it's drawn from foreign policy. If you were to buy a box of puzzles, and it says on the box that it's a 2,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. So I take a photograph of this room, and I make 2,000 pieces, put it together, 2,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. Then I go home, I open up this thing, clean up the dining table, I take all the pieces out, but I find a piece of paper inside. And it says, thank you for buying this puzzle. It says it takes 2,000 pieces to complete this puzzle. It's true. It does take 2,000 pieces. But in this box, there are 2,500 pieces. 500 pieces will fit, but they are not part of problem solution you have to first find those 500 and discard them. In foreign policy, it is this ability to discard false information that becomes critical. And I think unless you're able to find the red herrings, unless you're able to find deception, you're not going to be able to solve the problem. One of the examples in public diplomacy, for example, that, that, is, that is worth thinking about is that the KGB acknowledged that they had carried out an extraordinary exercise in which they said that the HIV AIDS that had spread across the globe was actually a miscalculation on the part of a weapon that Washington had made and that the CIA was going to use whenever they had a war. Now, they acknowledged this, but
but they had actually put out the information saying that the CIA is using this and it's backfired. Now, that is deception. And a lot of people believe deception. So I think in the foreign policy that we were crafting, the most enjoyable challenge, if you like, was being, the exciting challenge, was being able to see if we could find the right pieces of the puzzle. So now let me tell you the new challenges. I think there are five challenges I'll speak about. There's not enough time. Um, the first challenge is the challenge of communication. And not just communication, the speed of communication. At a time when I was a young diplomat and at a time when my boss, the Indian ambassador in, in Egypt, was a young diplomat, communication simply did not exist at the speed with which you people know about it. Today, you get real-time news, real-time. And I remember when I was, um, I was giving a talk in Geneva um, on WTO and, and the position that the government of India had taken on a subject which got classified as a new issue, which was on labor standards. It basically means, uh, can you use child labor? And if you don't use, uh, if you use child labor, can we ban your product? And developing countries took the position that this was a non-trade issue that was being brought into the trade agenda. And there was a strong discussion on this. So I was trying to present the government of India's position. There was a big hall, lots of people, and people started walking out one after the other. So while I was talking, I initially asked myself in my mind, are they boycotting my talk? Then someone came to me and said, stop, come outside. And everyone was standing around the television. And the first aircraft had just hit one of the twin towers. And we then, as we stood there, watched the second aircraft. This was real time, real time. We were watching as the aircraft was going to hit, right? During the generations that existed before, this did not happen. The speed of communication was not there. In other words, you saw an event, you then wrote a dispatch, which went as a classified dispatch in a category A bag. By the time that secret document was opened at the other end, two weeks may have passed. Two weeks may have passed. So you then sat down and who did you make as your friends? You made it, your friends started becoming investigative journalists. You became essentially an investigative journalist because you were trying to ferret and get information out from government circles and from people elsewhere. Many people, for example, academics like yourself, became sources of extraordinary information. But you also needed to ask yourself, were they one of the pieces of that 500 pieces that fitted, but were not going to help you solve that puzzle? So I think the speed of communication is a critical challenge that all diplomacy needs to adjust to. Second. Let me give you another example on speed of diplomacy, uh, speed of communication. Do you watch Netflix? You watch? Have you watched a film called Crown? My wife made me watch it, and I, I, I must confess I enjoyed it thoroughly. You remember that sequence where Queen Elizabeth hears about her father's death? She heard it on the telephone. It took a long time for uh, the, the palace, for Buckingham Palace, to be able to get through to Elizabeth, who was holidaying with her husband in Kenya, to be able to tell her, your father's dead, you're the next Her Majesty. And this, again, is the delay in communication. I mean, we, we've heard about communication. There's a system that started many years ago called the Runners, 
you know, you wanted to convey something, people ran from one place to the other. You then had them on horseback. You know, so communication was done in a very strange way. Sometimes you did it with a special envoy who took a ship and went from Delhi to London and communicated with the king on what was happening. Cables and stuff like that are much later. Today, none of this secrecy is required. You pick up your mobile phone and you've got it, which brings me to the second challenge, which is internet. The internet has dramatically changed the world. And this drama of changing the world is, is, is quite interesting. And I argue that for every positive X, if you like, there is a negative X. And give me a, let me give you an example. You know, we all, there's nobody here who would argue that a solar panel is not a good thing. Many people would argue that renewable energy, tapping into solar power is a great thing. By the way, um, I don't know how many of you do know, but every single solar panel anywhere in the world has a bit of technology from the University of New South Wales. We are the world leaders on solar energy. But you know the negative X of solar panels? Solar panels have a life. And today their disposal is a hazardous waste. And people haven't quite figured out how do you dispose a solar panel whose life is over. So with every X, there is a negative X. Nuclear energy, many would argue, is a fantastic thing. Nuclear waste is hazardous, and disposal of nuclear waste is not easy. The internet is extraordinarily powerful, but so is cybercrime. India's cybersecurity business, they say that by 2025, will become $62 billion. Just the cybersecurity industry. So when we look at every X, there is a negative aspect involved with it. And to a large extent today, many diplomats need to grapple with this whole issue where cybersecurity is compromised. It is argued, for example, that our defense computers are being hacked from somewhere, from a completely alien destination altogether. And that when you investigate, you find that the station from where it is being hacked is actually being run from a station somewhere else. We have a very strong, again, in the university cybersecurity program, which is, which is entirely based not on defense, which is, you know, all of us work on defense. So what we do is that we tell ourselves that passwords are like toothbrushes, you never share it, right? And passwords are like toothbrushes because you always change it as frequently as you possibly can. And so we are safe. I tell myself, I use a Mac, and a Mac cannot be compromised. And Professor Richard Buckland, who, who is an international expert on cybersecurity and works at the university, said that it is possible for me to sit in Sydney, hit a computer in Beijing, and actually impact Cambodia. Now, we are talking in terms of driverless cars. Right? A driverless car is a car which is operated by a computer system and a sophisticated software. We all know terrorist attacks take place by loading a truck or a jeep or whatever it is with RDX, and then you go and hit it. It's a suicide bomber. If you have a driverless car, you can actually move 10,000 driverless cars in 10,000 different stations simultaneously without a driver, and cause havoc. So I think for every plus, there is a minus.
this becomes an extraordinary challenge for, for diplomacy, not just for Indian diplomats. Because God knows, we never looked at the entire area of cybersecurity as part of the foreign policy's requirements. But it now becomes very critical for us to be able to appreciate that your national strategic interests can actually be dramatically compromised through various means using the facility of internet. You're sitting in a great place which is known for some fantastic things. Let me leave two thoughts with you. If I do a cyber intervention in your traffic light system in a city in like Mumbai, or if in Chicago airport or New York airport or in Tokyo, which are very busy airports, or Heathrow, or Delhi, or Mumbai, affect the air traffic control. Or in Mahe, at your Kasturba Gandhi Medical School, if I were to mix up all medical records, can you imagine the impact this would have? Now, this is an extraordinary new challenge that you have to look at, keeping in mind that it is an offshoot of a very, very positive X. But there's a third challenge. And the third challenge to my mind is that the internet also gave you a wonderful thing. It gave you social media, right? And you tracked social media. You tracked how people thought. Arvind, how am I doing? Should I finish in another five, 10 minutes? Yeah, so I'll take five, 10 minutes. I'll do a compromise. Eight minutes is okay. <laughs> All right, so social media. Again, becomes a very powerful instrument for us to be able to look at. And um, even foreign offices use it. Nowadays, you'll find that on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, consulates and high commissions, governments are actually posting things. This is part of public diplomacy. But they're posting things over there. They're trying to tell you their story, which is what public diplomacy is all about, to tell our story, okay, so that you better understand our story. You don't have a misperception. But social media has triggered something else which all you and I and all of us are facing, which is fake news. How do you deal with fake news? Fake news is something which is intentionally implanted. I give you the example of the KGB, a public acknowledge by, acknowledgement by the head of the KGB on HIV AIDS. Let me give you another example that took place. When the Americans were dropping in Afghanistan food parcels, it was then spread like wildfire Please don't pick up these food parcels because they are being dropped in areas that are fully mined. And if you try to go and pick it up, you'll get bombed. You'll lose a leg, a hand, a head, whatever it is. And those food parcels have no food in them. It's just to tempt you to go and get yourself killed. This was blatantly false information. It was propaganda. It was fake information. It was deception. But the point is, can deception become a tool of foreign policy? Can deception shift perception into misperception? The answer is yes. Today, for example, the WHO head tells you that there is more advice available on the internet on coronavirus and what you should do about it than the number of people killed. At the same time, there is also information on the net which says total number of people killed in China is not known because the Chinese government is suppressing the information. How do we know? How do we know 
We don't. We speculate. But it is on the basis of this speculation, which could be a piece of the puzzle which fits but is not going to solve the problem, that we build foreign policy. The fifth item that I'd mentioned to you is uncertainty and risk. Now, in, in business school, normally we work with uncertainty. And, and I think we work with uncertainty all through our life on everything. Uncertainty needs to be in a band which is predictable, which means I believe it, there is going to be uncertainty, but the uncertainty has a certainty element also to it, and therefore the risk to that extent is controlled. But imagine if there is no band, and I'll give you an, two, three examples on this. President Donald Trump of the United States is completely unpredictable. And you have to base your foreign policy on being able to gauge, understand, anticipate, and craft a foreign policy, assuming that uncertainty. It's not an easy challenge. When Prime Minister Narendra Modi first took over as Prime Minister in 2014, no one anticipated that he would say that on the date in which he is assuming power as Prime Minister, he would like to invite heads of state and government from the neighboring countries. It's completely uncertain. It was not an advice given to him by bureaucrats or by diplomats. It was his own thinking. I think today we are discovering more and more as diplomats that the days in which we actually sat down, analyzed a problem, then went to the prime minister's office and said, look, this is the problem, this is what we recommend, you do this, you do that, and here is a speech for you to do, and then he presents. That's gone. That's gone. I think President Donald Trump is a great example of that. President, prime Minister Narendra Modi is again a great example of that. So is the President of the Philippines. So is the Prime Minister of Britain. So is the German Chancellor. People are now taking positions where they're not dictated, driven solely by bureaucrats. Of course, of course, the diplomats' position is taken into consideration. But the argument that is given is if your relationship with Pakistan over the last 70 years has been predicated based on a particular line of thinking, could it be that this line of thinking does not deliver? If your relationship with Beijing has been crafted since the 1960 episode, 60s episode, could it be that we need fresh thinking? And this is now coming from the political system. And I think this uncertainty this element of risk, this unpredictable uncertainty is a critical part. And the last element I'll leave with you is the emergence of new issues. Diplomats, um, right through the years, engage with governments, but there were clear indications of what was a foreign policy issue as opposed to what was not a foreign policy issue. Climate change was never considered to be a foreign policy issue. Water. These were not issues that you dealt with, counterterrorism and terrorism. These are all WTO and trade negotiations. Coronavirus and how you will deal with it. This, I mean, diplomats are dealing with it. Diplomats across the globe from China are trying to explain what Der Spiegel in its controversial title, referred to as Made in China, Coronavirus. There is a WhatsApp joke going around that very strangely, China has entered so much of our life and everyday life that your death now would be made in China. Now, all of this 
needs then countering. And Chinese diplomats are actually on the forefront trying to deal with a subject like coronavirus and its fallout as part of foreign policy and diplomacy. So I think a cluster of new issues which were never part of the, of the menu, if you like, of what diplomacy did are now part of that menu. And you have to deal with it and take it forward. I think I've spent my eight minutes and I'd say that I'm very happy to interact with you, answer as many questions as I possibly can. I apologize once again that if I had used some visuals, it would perhaps have been a little stronger, but I had a bit of a handicap. And next time, I hope I do a little better. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir, for a really very comprehensive lecture. And the way you correlated the things, I think, was a great learning experience for us. We have some five minutes, uh, five to seven minutes for Q&A. Those of you who would like to ask question, please introduce yourself and then ask the question. Yeah. My name is Karthike. I'm a second year student. Uh, it was a very moving speech, sir, and uh, it was quite enlightening. The thing was, uh, you mentioned about the jigsaw puzzles. Of course, you talked about the complexities in it. The thing is, uh, in real life, in real world, uh, in, in a jigsaw puzzle, all the pieces are equal in size. But in real world, the pieces are not equal in size. So in your stint in foreign service, was, uh, you must have seen diplomacy gated different, different powers. So you, you must have seen that there must have been some complexities attached to it, some challenges. How do you gear diplomacy towards different powers? I think, uh, uh, firstly, thanks very much for, for your question. Um, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, uh, but so, so don't take it in the wrong way. Uh, sit, sit, sit. Um, one is that um, jigsaw puzzles, the pieces are not equal in size. I just shared with you one example of a jigsaw puzzle. What I will be sharing in the talk I'll be giving now, which, by the way, I'm told is open to everyone. And uh, uh, Arvind can decide whether <laughs> you can attend that talk or not. But I was going to give you two more examples, which I'll give there, and I'll share with you. If I want to really raise the level of complexity, I told it was number of pieces. Pieces are not equal in size and it's the complexity of design. I can complicate it even further. And this is something that um, some commercial companies are discussing with me. It is, it is, it is delineated in, in the book that Manish mentioned to you, um, which is uh, 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 Lessons from Ruslana in Search of Transformative Thinking. So there are two ways I can actually raise the bar even more. One is when you buy the jigsaw puzzle, the design, the completed design is on the cover. So one of the ways of raising the complexity bar is by having an image which is completely different from the solution. So if I want to do an image of a black cat and the pieces of the puzzle are not of a black cat but of a, a knight with just some stars, you will be trying to find the black cat, but actually it's not the black cat. It's the night with stars. The other level of increasing difficulty is I give you a puzzle with a blank cover. You just don't know how to solve it because you don't know the final image. So I think foreign policy and diplomats when we engage with different countries, we ask ourselves the core question, is this relationship critical to my national interest, strategic interest? And if it is, what do I do about it? If it is, but they are not our allies, what do I do about it? If it is, not, it is critical, but they are allies with my enemies, what do I do about it? So I think the craft of foreign policy, the craft of diplomacy, is being able to navigate multiple terrains simultaneously and giving recommendations. And as you know, if you, if you deal with counterterrorism or you, you are a fan of people like John Le Carre and Len Dayton and read spy novels, there are people who produce information and there are people who process information. 
So there are people who produce the pieces of the puzzle, but there are people who sit and put them together. Very rarely is it the same person who picks up the pieces and puts it together. Very rarely. But there are people who do it. Uh, good morning, sir. My name is Arushi Singh. I am a first year student here. And thank you for your speech. It was very enlightening. So, sir, uh, I was uh, we have heard about these famous uh, diplomats like Richard Holbrook and Sergio de Mello. So, who were one some of the most skilled diplomats that you ever met in your service? The most, uh, most skilled, most effective, and what were their uh, what were their unique qualities that you found uh, helpful in their diplomacy? Um, that's a that's a tough question because for me, uh, you know, my perception of a great diplomat is uh, a person who may go against my interest, but maybe uh, you know or the interest of the country I represent, which is India. Uh, but who is able to skillfully ensure the interests um, of, of the people who, who pay his monthly salary. And one of the truly crafty diplomats, in my view, was Henry Kissinger. And I think um, a lot of people would see him, you may disagree with him, you may dislike him, you may do, you know, whatever. But I think he had his eye on the ball. He knew what he wanted. He was pretty ruthless about it. He had, of course, uh, the full support of the government, uh, uh, the political system that was there. Uh, he, he reached out not only to governments, but to various stakeholders. And he, he pushed through. Uh, what he believed was in the maximum interest of Washington. I would say there's a lot to learn from, from people like him. Um, I would also think that uh, very skillful diplomats are those from Israel because uh, they need to be able to push across or push through uh, a series of challenges that they face. Um, and, and it's not an easy set of challenges. Among Indian diplomats, I've had the great honor of serving under some outstanding foreign secretaries, uh, one whom, uh, many of whom I, I love dearly and respect dearly. But I thought Jagat Mehta was a fantastic scholar diplomat. Uh, he's written extensively, and uh, it's worth reading his, his stuff. Um, I think Jain Dixit was a uh, uh, was an outstanding foreign secretary as well, who enjoyed the, the support of government. Um, I, I truly admire um, uh, Professor and Ambassador Muchkunt Bey, but uh, his entire inclination was towards economic diplomacy, which is again something I, I respect. Jay Shankar is a friend of mine from, from JNU and college, so I'm not at all objective about him. I, I think he's one of the brightest persons I have known um, as, a, as a student who, who grew up with him. Uh, I think he has very sharp insight. Um, I, I, I think, therefore, uh, uh, the, the great diplomats are those who are able to, whether we like it or not, pursue the strategic interests of the country they serve and get it done. And, and, and God knows there are some extraordinary examples in history, uh, contemporary history, and of course, older history as well. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm Kanchi, and uh, I'm a second year student at this department. So you mentioned that one of the challenges that we currently face in public diplomacy is communication, and communication of this generation. So uh, would you also agree that as communication has become a challenge, it has expanded, its nature and character has also changed, which therefore also changes the kind of red herrings that we have today. So would that also mean that the impact that these particular red herrings that will be caused by change in communication will have a dif uh, we need to have a different strategy to deal with these changes? Certainly, I mean, certainly. Uh, uh, le le let me give you uh, uh, a good example, which is a bad example. But uh, let me put it this way. You know, uh, some eight, maybe nine or ten years ago, I joined Facebook. 
and um, uh, Deepa and I have one daughter, and my daughter, who, who, who normally thinks I'm an oldie, said, Baba, that's so cool, you know, you joined Facebook. Now I'm still on Facebook. And he says, Baba, get over it. You know, no one uses Facebook other than your generation. Now when you look at social media, if social media is going to be dealt with by people of my generation, we are going to be a disaster. Social media has to be handled by a younger group which knows how to reach out to a younger group. One of the critical problems of any intervention is being able to recognize who you're servicing and therefore how you're servicing. If you're going to have a visual communication and you want to reach the people in Karnataka and you decide, and I'll give you, I'll give you an example that, that is something, a project that I work on. Now, you know, the second biggest killer of women in India with cancer is cervical cancer. And it is the one cancer that can actually be solved if you get tested on time, all right? If you go through a screening process of time. Now, if you prepare a visual communication aid for women in Karnataka or in India and do it in the Finnish language or in Norwegian, it's not going to work, right? So you have to decide your language of communication the kind of imagery in the communication that actually is going to get the person up and into the screening system. And then look at the results and take the follow-up action. Now, how do you do that? Now, to be able to understand this requires different kinds of mindsets and also requires technical specialization. You cannot leave all this to diplomats of, of my age or, or senior people who are used to handling tools in a particular way. So I think public diplomacy gets strengthened depending on the pillar that you're going to intervene in, say social media, by who you're going to get to intervene there. So I would say yes, most certainly we need to undergo changes. Uh, very good morning, sir. My name is Mayank. Uh, I'm a first year student here. Uh, sir, um, I'd like to start off by thanking you for your analogy because uh, as a former student of philosophy, I really appreciate the fact that we raised a few very important epistemic questions. Um, I'd like to give you an example of what I think is a very relevant way of understanding what information does in foreign policy. Now, in August 2016, there were a lot of news reports by Western media that said that the, that Assad had used his chemical weapons program against his own civilians. Um, now I understand, sir, that you're right in saying that sometimes the puzzle of foreign policy is as such that there is no picture that can help us and guide our decisions. And at the end of the day, we have to use only our national interests to justify our actions. But in specific circumstances, um, the information given to us is of a such great magnitude that action needs to be taken immediately. But the problem is that we can't always be sure about the information. So how do we, how do we act in that kind of a situation? I, th I think this, uh, sir, is, is one of the great, great new challenges that we face. Because what is now a fact is that fake news is very much part of the external environment we live in. Uh, with 24-7 uh, news, uh, TRP ratings go up. Um, we know that it is easy to manipulate uh, the internet. People sitting in this room can actually distort using Photoshop. Uh, all these tools are available, which are positive tools. They're the positive X to be able to use them for the negative X. I think it's very important for us not to rely on information from a single source as the decision-making criteria, but to be able to test the information before action is taken. And um, it, it delays things sometimes, but I do believe that lessons have been learned 
that we operated on the basis of a single widely circulated piece of information that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and therefore, and their lack of cooperation required the bombing of Iraq and regime change. We realize after the deaths of many, several who are referred to as collateral damage, a region which is even today uh, completely unstable, that caution is possibly the better part of not valor, but stupidity. So all of you would agree that it was really a great fascinating experience in listening to the lecture by Ambassador Amit Das Gupta. And that too a very, very important theme, very complex theme too. In fact, new challenges for world diplomacy and the way he narrated and explained to us in such a nice manner, all of us now have understood what are those uh, new challenges for world diplomacy. Sir, we really thank you for a really comprehensive and uh, a very excellent lecture delivered by you. And we look forward to meeting you again at 3 o'clock. Again, we would like to learn from you about uh, the nuclear dimension in India-Australia relations. Please join me in thanking Ambassador Amit Das Gupta.